Welcome to Fun with Information Technology. I am your favorite IT teacher, Ms. Shana Day. And today, continuing our topic on problem solving, we're gonna look closer into elementary data types. Now, by the end of this lesson, you should have developed skills to use the correct data types to solve a problem. Today we're going to be looking at one, two, three, four, five elementary data types. Let's see them on screen. Number one, we have integers. Number two, real numbers. Number three, characters. Number four, strings. And number five, booleans. Let's start off with integers. Now an integer data type represents some range of mathematical integers. Now, Integral data types may be of different sizes and may or may not be allowed to contain negative values. Integers are commonly represented in a computer as a group of binary digits or bits. The size of the grouping varies, so the set of integer sizes available varies between different types of computers and different programming languages. All right, now for example, so let's say you have a black dog named Mo. Mo has three distinct features. Number one, his fur is black. Number two, eyes brown. Number three, tail feathery. He also has a name, of course. Now let's say you want to turn Mo into a character from a video game. Now all of these values that describe Mo will be written out in a code. Here's this code on screen. So we have name, mo, fur, black, eyes, brown, tail, feathery. Now, one thing you would notice, and we will highlight it soon, of these codes being in uplifted commas. Now, each value is represented with a string of letters. So we call it a string. Now, let's say we want to change his eyes. First, find the eyes variable in the code. You can delete the value it stores by deleting it and typing in something new. Now, strings aren't the only piece of information that our program needs. To keep track of, uh, for example, Mo is nine years old, soon to be 10. Now we want to store the value of her age in a variable as seen on screen. We can change the number of the value when we need to. Now, looking on screen, you can see while some variables store a string like green, other variables store an integer. All right, and you're seeing this eyes, green, that's a string, age 10, that's an integer. So an integer expressed before is like a whole number. So a variable can stay the same, but an integer can change, which would obviously change the outcome. So the integer data type basically represents whole numbers, no fractional parts. The integer value jumps from one value to another there is nothing between six and seven, okay? Now it could be asked, why not make all your numbers floating point, which allow for fractional parts? The reason is threefold. First, some things in the real world are not fractional. A dog, even with only three legs, is still one dog and not three quarters of a dog. Second, the integer data type is often used to control program by counting. Thus, the need for a data type that jumps from one value to another. Third, integer processing is significantly faster within the CPU than is floating point processing. You never knew that. Now you know. Now, the integer data type has similar attributes and acts or behave similarly in all programming languages that support it. Now, for the C++, 
and Swift, the size of a default integer, varies with the compiler being used and the computer. This effect is known as being machine dependent. These variations of the integer data type are an annoyance for a beginning programmer. Now, it is important that they understand the general attributes of the integer data type that apply to most programming languages. So it's all about your understanding. Take your time. We're not rushing. All right. So an integer is not a fraction. It is a whole number. All right. Now let's get to real numbers. Now, real numbers are numbers that include fractions or values after the decimal point. Now, for example, 123.75 is a real number. This type of number is also known as a floating point number. All floating point numbers are stored by a computer system using a mantissa and an exponent. Now, the following example is used to illustrate the role of the mantissa and the exponent. It does not fully reflect the computer's method for storing real numbers, but gives a general idea. Now, the number 123.75 can be represented by using mathematical scientific notation as, let's have a look on screen, 1.2375 times 102 equals to 123.75. Multiplying by 10 to the power of 2, which is 102, moves the value up two places or the decimal point down two places. So that the number 123 is before the decimal point, while the number 75 now comes immediately after the decimal point. In this example, the mantisa is 1.2375 and the exponent is 2. Generally, you can think of this as mx10e. To represent the same value in binary, apply the following rules. So represent the number 123.75 as, let's have a look on screen at this uh, binary. So we have 6 to 4 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 2 plus 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25 is equal to 123.75. Now, if you look at the diagram, yes, you'll see how now we get this binary, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Now, don't get confused, all right? To understand the exponent, okay, you place the decimal point after the most significant bit of the mantisa. The most significant bit is the leftmost bit. Now, the computer will not store the actual decimal point as part of the floating point number, but in this example, it is used for you know, illustrative purposes. So as you can see, 1.1110111. Now, to calculate the exponent, it is necessary to determine how many places the decimal point would need to move to give the correct number. Now, in this case, the decimal point would need to move six places to the right. Now, as seen on screen, decimal point must move six places to accurately represent 123.75. So the exponent for our number is 6 in binary. The number 6 is as 4 plus 2 equal 6. All right, as seen on screen. In order to represent 123.75,
the mantissa would be one 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 zero one 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 and the exponent would be 110. Now this can be thought of as mx 2 e where m represents the mantissa and e represents the exponent. So it will be 1.1110 one 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 times 2 to 110 power. There will always be a trade-off between accuracy and range when using floating point notation, as there will always be a set of number of bits allocated to storing real numbers. All right, so two points to note, that increasing the number of bits devoted to the mantissa will improve the accuracy of a floating point number. And point two, increasing the number of the bits devoted to the exponent will increase the range of numbers that can be held. All right, let's absorb that and let us jump ahead to characters. Now, characters can also be represented in binary. Characters are usually grouped together in a character set. A character set includes one, alphanumeric data, which is letters and numbers, number two, symbols, and number three, control characters, such as shift, escape, etc. Now, the ASCII uses eight bits to represent a character. Now, for those of you who don't know what an ASCII, it is an abbreviation for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. A standard data transmission code that is used by smaller and less powerful computers to represent both textual data, which is letters, numbers, and punctuation marks, and non-input device commands, okay? Control characters. Let's get back to the reading. Now, one of the bits is a, what we call a parity bit. Now, this is used to perform a parity check which is a form of error checking, yes? Now this uses up to one bit. So ASCII represents 128 characters, the equivalent of seven bits with eight bits rather than 256. For example, the ASCII code for lowercase z is 122 and is shown on screen. Now, it is possible to disregard the use of a parity bit to allow the ASCII to represent 250 characters. Now, this is known as extended ASCII. There are different versions of an extended ASCII in use. One, ASCII uses eight bits to represent the character. Two, ASCII can represent 128 characters. And these are some points to note. ASCII sets the most significant bit as a parity bit. Number four, extended ASCII can allow for the representation of 256 characters and disregards that use of a parity bit. And lastly, ASCII is less demanding on the memory use than Unicode. Now for everything there's a limitation. Now the 128 or 256 character limits of the ASCII and extended ASCII limits the number of character sets that can be held, representing the character sets for several different language structures. It is not possible in ASCII there are just not enough available characters. All right, so earlier I mentioned Unicode. Now, Unicode was created to allow more character sets than ASCII. Unicode used 16 bits to represent each character. This means that Unicode is capable of representing 65,536 different characters and a much wider range of character sets. 
All right, so now some key points once again. The character amount can go as high as 65,536. So it uses 16-bits to represent each character. Unicode can represent a greater range of character sets than the ASI. I. There are adapted forms of the original Unicode standard cable of representing millions of characters. Now remember, we're just learning and understanding how to use these elementary data types, all right? As we get more into actually solving a problem, remember we have not yet solved the problem, we're going to, you know, determine um, which elementary data we're gonna use, all right? This is just us breaking these things down so we know what these data are, what the data types are, all right? String. A string is a data type used in programming such as an integer and floating point unit, but is used to represent text rather than numbers. It is comprised of a set of characters that can also contain spaces and numbers, all right? Now, for example, the word hamburger uh, and the phrase, I ate three hamburgers, seeing the, seeing the number three instead of the word three. Now, these are both strings. Even one, two, three, four, five could be considered a string if specified correctly. Typically, programmers must enclose the strings in quotation marks for the data to be recognized as a string and not a number or a variable. Remember I told you about those quotation marks earlier? Now you know why. Now, for example, all right, let's have a look on screen in the comparison. Now, if option one equals option two, then option one and option two may be variables containing integers, strings, or other data. If the values are the same, the test returns a value of true. Otherwise, the result is false in the comparison. Now, if option one equal option two, noticing the quotation marks, then option one and option two are being treated as strings. Therefore, the test is comparing the words option one and option two, which would return false. Now, the length of a string is often determined by using a null character. All right, as easy as that. So in identifying a string, quotation marks must be evident, all right? Boolean. Boolean, just as in algebra, it is used frequently in computer programming. Now a Boolean expression is any expression that has a Boolean value. For example, the comparison three is less than five, X is less than five, X is less than Y, and a is less than 16 are Boolean expressions. Now the comparison three is less than five always give the result true because three is less than five, always. The comparison x is less than five will give the result true when the variable x contains a number less than five and false when it contains a number that is greater than or equal to five. The variable x must contain a number of this comparison for it to make sense. Now the comparison x is less than y will give the results true when the variable x contains a value that is less than the value contained by the, by the variable y. Note, yes, that in some programming languages, the less than operation is only defined for numbers, but in others, it is defined for the other data types as well. Now, computer programmers use Boolean values to control selection and repetition in programs. For example, now in a cinema computer system, Boolean could be used to program the type of tickets people should get. Now, here it is written in a pseudocode. Now, I trust you remember what a pseudocode is. Now, let's have a look at it. Now, 
ask the user to type in their age in whole years. Store the input data in the variable age if age is less than 16. Now set the entrance fee equal 500. Otherwise, set entrance fee equal 1000. So that was your pseudocode. All right. Now, Boolean expressions may combine two or more Boolean values using the operations not, and, and or. This is used in many different algorithms. For example, once again, a cinema computer system could assess if people under 16 and over 16 are charged the concession rate. This is the algorithm in pseudocode. Let's have a look on screen once again. Ask the user to type in their age in years. Okay? Store the input data in the variable age. If age is less than 16 or age uh, more than 65. Otherwise, set entrance fee equal 1000. Now, in this example, the expression age less than 16 or age more than 65 will give you the value true. When the user's age is less than 16 or when it is greater than or equal to 65. Otherwise, it will give the value false. It is also possible to create variables that will hold Boolean values for later use. Now, let's have a look at this flowchart. Now we, now, we should remember what flowcharts are and also remember what each shape means and stands for. On screen, you'll see start, get users age as age, set concession, all right, equal false, is age less than 16 or age greater than 65? Following lines, if no, is concession true? Following lines, if no, set entrance fee to 1000, the end. Now, if you go back to is age less than 16 or age greater than 65, following lines, yes, set concession equal true. Continuing, following line, yes. Is concession true? Following line, yes. Set entrance fee to 500 and end. All right? So this is your flow chart depicting um, the information on cinema computer systems. All right? And determining the age less than 16 or age more than 16 for their concession. Okay? Now, the variables in the scenario are age, entrance, fee, and concession. Age can be any integer. Concession is used to hold a Boolean value and entrance fee. Now, this is set according to the status of the concession, which is 500 or 1,000. This can be expressed in pseudocode as follows. Let's have a look on screen once again. If age is less than 16, or age is greater than 65, then concession. If concession, then entrance fee equal 500. If not, concession, then entrance fee equal 1,000. Now, let's have a look at the truth table. Now, the truth table for this system will be headings, age under 16, question, age 65 plus, question, Concession question. So we're asking ourselves yes or no. Now age under 16. We have yes. No. No. Age 65 plus. We have no. Yes. Yes. The results. Concession. Yes. Yes. And no. Following the table on screen. Now, I trust that going through each of these elementary data types was successful and you have learned. All right.
Now remember, each elementary data type, the purpose of going through these is for you to be able to choose the correct data type to solve a problem, all right? Now, a big thank you for being a part of today's lesson. I trust you have learned. This is Fun with Information Technology. I am your IT teacher, Ms. Shauna Day. Bye.